Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruid and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speaker is Marta Maus. Marta is a professor of African linguistics at Leiden University. Its research focuses on the description of Cushitic languages, including Iraku and Alakwa, as well as the exploration of language and identity, latency changing verbal derivations, and the languages of Eastern West Africa. So today, Marta will be um, having a guided discussion. Um, it's titled uh, The Historical Linguistics of Hunter-Gatherers in East Africa, a discussion. Um, since we'd like to have participants input during the discussion, people will be able to unmute themselves whenever there is uh, a chance within the presentation to discuss things. Uh, just please make sure to raise your hand using the, the control panels underneath the participants uh, portion of Zoom to indicate that you would like to join uh, pose a question or have a comment. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and it will be released on the YouTube channel. And with that, the floor is for Marta. Just go ahead. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I had to, it's only my page down that works now. Okay, good. First, uh, a little bit of an explanation why this presentation in this, is in this form and why I want this discussion. So as many of you know, I have, uh, we have our project on the linguistic history of East Africa. Um, uh, and within that, that project, uh, uh, there are a few things that, uh, that bring us to, to deal with the languages of hunter-gatherers and of, of the robo. And one of them is the importance of for the reconstruction of, uh, of Cushitic and Tanzanian Cushitic of the branch of East Rift. That is the two languages, Kwatsa and Asa, and, and they are both uh, uh, dead, in fact. And um, I, I tried to, to find speakers of both of them. I, I found some remembrance of Asa and Kwatsa. Uh, I, I gave up after I was completely eaten by bad bugs and, and whatnot. And, um, but I had some promise. People said, no, there's somebody, et cetera, et cetera. Roland went uh, to the same place afterwards and he found actually family members of the same informants that Klaus and, uh, and Eric worked with uh, decades or a century before that. Uh, but the very little result uh, in what Roland collected. So um, we have to, to try to, to see what we can get out of the data that we have on these two uh, dead hunter-gatherer languages, Asa and Kwatsa. So that's why I also have to think of, uh, of the linguistic situation and the data gathering situation. And then, um, as part of the project, I think maybe the most uh, controversial or, or the, the, the deepest time is, is to think of the idea that there may have been other language families in East Africa that have disappeared. And um, well, actually, I think it's a fair assumption that there must have been more language families in East Africa in the course of time that have now completely disappeared. And can we find some traces of that in, in the current languages? Is there something like the parallel is there with the form of pygmy language? Can we find in substrate any evidence for a, something different there? Uh, let me try to see if I can go to this map. So, I am working on a little map and that's actually, I mean, just an aside where, and, and a database where we uh, notice uh, all the uh, mention of earlier people, because when you read the anthropological literature, you very often say, well, uh, when we arrived here before us, there were these, these people and are called the Verwana. And, and then you have all sorts of statements about these earlier people that, uh, that have disappeared. Often they're called Wasi, but sometimes they have specific names. And, and many, many, many uh, peoples in East Africa have such memories. I'm, I'm trying to get an overview. And the purpose of that overview is 
first and foremost to yeah to make clear that um, uh, that there must have been uh, much more diversity some time ago. It's also something that I had. I worked a little bit, and I think the next slide is it's about what what I've done in in this area. Not that much, but I have to feel that uh, it's something. Uh, different from when I work on Iraq, a very vibrant language, or when I work on these uh, other languages that I quote unquote called hunter-gatherer languages, but I take that as a very vague and broad term. And one of the things I want to discuss with you is what kind of distinctions are interesting to make in that very broad uh, field. What are the, the relevant comparative categories within that, if there are any? And then, of course, because I want to know how I can, uh, what I have to be careful about when I do my historical interpretations. So this is my, um, what, what have I done uh, uh, in the area of hunter-gatherer linguistics? Well, uh, first of all, I will bring you to the other side of Africa, West Africa. Well, I had a project um, uh, for the Bacola, the Bacola Dobes project. Uh, I didn't do much of the work, but I was uh, the initiator and the, and the head of the, the PI of the project. I learned a lot from the people who really worked in the project. Um, then Dan Duke, Emmanuel Ngwe, Ohm, uh, all of all, everybody there, they worked on different groups and we thought that this was one language with two competing names, Bacola and Bagiele. And um, during halfway during the project, we realized that it's uh, very difficult to, to know what we're actually dealing with. So Dan and Emmanuel, they have uh, presented several times on the chameleonic nature of, of the data that, that they collect. So they got a strong impression that the people, the pygmy people that they talk to, that, that they adjust to who was there. And sometimes they speak more like the Bassa, sometimes they speak more like the Quasio, sometimes uh, more like, uh, just depending on, on the, the audience that they have in the area that they have. So it's it, it's it's the, the distinction Bacola Bacchiele, those are just two words that I use for these people, but that doesn't really coincide with the two language varieties, and it's very difficult to know whether there is a norm, and, and that is for language, but actually uh, also for, yeah, ethnicity. I worked... Um, uh, to the Yaku, I always find an interesting story. They wanted me to, to prove that Yaku was still alive. Well, it was sort of, and I went there. And, and But uh, the four speakers who, who I could at some point maybe still call speakers, they have all passed away now. But they really wanted their language to be alive. That was completely different. Uh, Yaku is in Kenya, Mukogoro area. It's, it's uh, near Mount Kenya. It's a bottom of Mount Kenya. They live among the Maasai, so they now all speak Maasai. The Asa in the, in the Maasai plains south of, uh, of, of Arusha, of Moshi, actually, of the Kilimanjaro airport, not too far from Kilimanjaro airport. Um, I, I, I searched a lot, and I have all sorts of uh, anecdotes of, uh, of, of how you can be misled by searching for the Asa. In the end, I found people uh, who, who could give me words, but these were people who only remembered Asa from the time that their parents spoke it. They never spoke it themselves. Um, so with uh, Sara Petrolino, we have an article on that. On, and, and that's, we learned a lot about uh, how, uh, yeah, misleading the memory can be uh, for of those people. I mean, we get, we get data, we get words, and they're not all made up. Most of them were not made up, but they were difficult to deal with. But they don't want to be Asa anymore. They are Maasai, and that's what they want to be. Uh, but otherwise, I worked 
on all sorts of languages, mainly in East Africa, but those were very much alive and settled languages and maybe of a different nature. Uh, for this Bacola, Bacchiele identities uh, uh, in discussions with the um, PhD student then we came to a whole list. What is your identity? What are you as a Pikmi? Forest forager or is it mainly that you're not a farmer different from, from the farmers or that you're more a servant to the farmer master? Do you belong to a camp? There are several camps in the, in the forest and is that, do you belong to that? But people move to different camps. Okay, there are some marriage restrictions. That is, I think, the closest that comes to a way to define somebody as part of a social group. Or do you say, okay, I feel myself linked to a certain master, so I'm uh, my master's quasio, so I'm a quasio related. Pick me that kind of identity. Or is it just as a group of people who live together and work together, or as a group of uh, a kind of a village, very small village where people uh, live. Um, and at I was in the course that I that, that we were teaching this semester on the language and human past, with the contributions from all parts of the world. I did a little bit on East Africa, and I, I ended my discussion on the the robo uh, that on. On the Dorobo, that uh, with a kind of things, a research agenda, I think mainly for myself, what do I want to know? So, this is for this uh, discussion. What I want to get out of the discussion is to what extent are these, these groups who hunt, maybe also gather, speak something comparable? Is, is a, a group decision an effective language policy? Is that really possible, maybe? And this is, this is in light of an uh, observation that Matthias Brensinger made about the Yaku that I had to laugh about when I was reading it. He said that uh, the Yaku came together in a meeting, official um, formal meeting uh, sometime in the 80s. And um, at that meeting, they decided that they would no longer speak Yaku and give it up for Maasai. Um, I, I never thought uh, that uh, there's anything like that kind of language policy where the, the yeah, speakers take this kind of decision. And, uh, and now I, I'm not so sure anymore. Is it, is it feasible that uh, it's a small group? They can get all of them together. Uh, would, they, would, would, they be, would they feel inclined to make group decisions of this kind? So this is something that I also struggle with. Uh, one of the questions I had is, uh, and it will come in, will we come in the next slide anyway. But um, when when I was reading Bauman, uh, end of the 19th century, and when he got comes to the Hadza, just before that, he, he meets some Dorobo in the uh, uh, there in uh, near Ngorongoro, and he calls him Dorobo, and then. Uh, just after that, he meets the Hadza. He doesn't call them Dorobo. So what is it? that these people saw that some people are, are identified as, as the robo and some are not, is that just taken over from their Maasai guides or, or did they have a feeling themselves that were dealing with different entities? Um, is there a link of these? I, I'm just uh, giving a lot of questions and food for thought. Is, is there a link to the land? Because sometimes you, you get the robo groups that say, well, we are the robo of this area, and then they have the, the, the people of that area. Is there extensive variation in a small group? Sometimes people say, if you have a small speech community, then, then you know, okay, Peter speaks like that, so that's okay. Uh, we can tolerate that. Uh, and something that's also on my mind is uh, how different is this the robo water situation in East Africa compared to the Pygmy social linguistics. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit of, of uh, so why I have this discussion. Uh, I want to, to have a first question that I will introduce is what are these distinctions in these groups? And, and, and so I'll talk a little bit about it and then I want to discuss that uh, with all of you, what kind of distinctions are meaningful. 
edit, I have already talked about this. So um, the people, early people, they talk about true the robo. So what does it mean to, if somebody is called the robo? Some of them, some people talk about impoverished the robo and uh, all the hunter gatherers that are not called the robo. Um, I have the feeling that for some people, uh, the robo means a hunter gatherer group that is linked to the Maasai or maybe to some other group of cattle keepers, in which case they would be very different. Uh, very similar to the Wata in uh, northern Kenya, southern Ethiopia, Wata, different uh, territories, the, these hunter-gatherers who call themselves Wata or were called Wata, who are linked to the Oromo, they speak Oromo, uh, but they don't intermarry into the Oromo, they are uh, people of a lesser kind and people who are polluted and can do certain tasks that they find too dangerous. Um, so there, there is a, a clear link between Wata and, and Oromo, but I have the feeling that that link is much weaker or, 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 or less pronounced between the, uh, um, the Oromo and the Maasai, the Akiak and the Maasai, or the Asa and the Maasai, the Yako and the Maasai, the Not and the Maasai. And, uh, in among the pygmies, uh, what I uh, encountered there is a much more a uh, specific link. I mean, a specific ethnic community of, of farmers that is as well defined as ethnic communities uh, go to uh, a group of pygmies and and but also at the individual level to certain families and. And the, those links, fam, ties are even inherited. I don't have not come across anything like that uh, in uh, in East Africa. And I, I state these things so that somebody will shout and say, you're wrong. A uh, uh, vague map, but it doesn't matter. It's just to show that there are so many different entities called the robot in East Africa. This is a list from a booklet by Wambua on the Dorobo of one district in Kenya. This is one page, there's a second page. So he has over 60 named groups of, of that he distinguishes of different kind of Dorobo people assimilated to the Kalenjin, Kikuyu or the Maasai. So in this term of categorization, one, uh, a first try. Those that have their own language but no master, whatever master means, the Hadza, Sandawe, Dahalo, Boni. Those that have a master but, and, but a language, a different language from the master, at least once a different language from the masters, Yaku, Akiek, Okiek, Hadza. The Ika also mentioned as Dorobo in the literature. And those that have the same language as their masters, so is the Wata, and many of these other groups that are now shifted to, to Maasai, so the Yaku, Akiak, Okiak in the present day, Asa. Uh, that, that is the first distinction I, uh, that I wonder about, is that, that useful for us? Uh, how does that compare to then pygmy groups in Western Central Africa? I've mentioned that, but also to other occupational groups such as smiths, you have groups of smiths. In, if, if you, if you in, the, um, in the area just uh, there of the Niramba, Nihanzu, uh, Nyaturu, up to, up to uh, Sukuma, that whole area north of, uh, of, the, of the rift, they, uh, the Adis, uh, what else, Lunda, there are these groups of Smiths who have their own language, who come from a group in the Great Lakes region. Um, how is that different from, from this, uh, these uh, hunter-gatherer groups? Uh, or should we maybe um, take them also in, in a comparison? A lot of, a lot of the, uh, these uh, people, farmers now, they talk about original inhabitants and that they were once uh, uh, hunter-gatherers, those initial, those former people, and that they have now become part of them. Um, 
and but then there are also hunt, hunt I call them hunting bands. I mean, uh, in in the in the Tanzania Rift Valley, you have mention of the Mbakua elephant hunters that um, the the German uh, administrator, the first Germans who arrived there, they met uh, Makua people, so all the way from uh, near Mozambique and in Mozambique, who were hunting elephants for the ivory there and who had their own settlements. Uh, but they were clearly seen as, as Makua and as diff different from, from, uh, from the Robo, from Akiak, from all of those. In the whole talk about, uh, of course, people who, who um, yeah, make a distinction between, I mean, I mentioned before, through the robo or impoverish the robo, so that people see these groups, hunter gatherers, whether the robo or not, as survivor of a, a former age, and, and they, they are still hunting and gathering from the old age until now. And, and, um, and some of them say, well, no, they are, uh, recent people, there were people who had cattle who have then uh, lost their cattle and impoverished and, and now they are linked to the cattle holders because they once were, were cattle uh, people and they were forced to, to, to go to hunting and gathering. I have mentioned these other things then. So what kind of language contact uh, is there with the other languages for the Akiak in the, in the nice grammar by uh, 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 König and Heine and Leger? There is, uh, they mention an article by uh, uh, that, that the Akiak they speak of Maasai, for, for some, for, yeah, Maasai mainly, but also more and more speak Ngu from Gulu, uh, a group of um, farmers, because more and more they're farming and with farming, they think that they also should know the language of the farmers, and then, of course, Swahili. So Masa is the dominant culture to them, but it's shifting a bit to, to the farmer culture. Uh, they are in different settlements. Uh, actually, quite a number of different spots are the Akiak in the, in the Maasai plains. And they have, for some of them, they have they they themselves give them different names. And, and if you look at how they see the world, do I have that on the next slide? Yes, I have this on the next slide. So this is the distinctions that the Akia make among the people around them, the Akia, and Akia are also those other people hunting and gathering in the Maasai Plains. Kisangare, uh, Kinangate, those are people that, that we are very ready to include in the, in the term Akia because they speak the same language, but the Aramani, those are a different name for the Asa, they once spoke another language, but they are considered Akia to the Akia. Um, just to, to show you that their yeah, way of, of dividing the people, the world up in different people is, is different from, from what we, uh, we scientists do. They have Puni for the Maasai and Ikwapi for the Maasai, two different kinds of Maasai. Um, they have um, two different words for, for Bantu people, the Meye and the Isanke. The Meye, those are uh, farmers and then, so Bantu speaking, but also Sandawe, um, to them are also typical farmers. Uh, but they dif differentiate them, and that is a bit confusing to all of us, from the Gogo and the Pare Bantu. No idea there why those are special. And then they talk about the Burungi. Burungi. The Burungi, the South Kushite group that is actually geographically quite close to the, to the Akia. And when I was among the Akia, I met uh, two Burungi guys who were there uh, making beehives for them. And um, Akia are the famous uh, uh, bee honey collectors. The, the Burungi are also, uh, honey is very important to them. So I a uh, distinct feeling that for the, for the Akia, the Burungi had this modern way of making real hives to, uh, to do in, 
to get honey rather than just honey hunting for where you find it and uh, uh, and 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 they have a special relation then to the burungi so this is how the akia see the world around them but i find no individual kind of client to master relation in uh, I, I, I never saw mention of that uh, I was amazed that um, when you look at this, the, the, the questionnaire that, uh, that uh, Christa Koenig and, and, and her co-authors did among the Akje, that uh, there was quite uh, not that much intermarriage with the Maasai or at all. It was, um, I thought, my view of these, uh, these hunting gatherers was what I learned among the Asa is that these, these are groups that, that absorb all sorts of people who are lost in society. So if you're on the run and, and, and you're sought by the police, then this is where you can survive. Or if you're expelled from your community because you murdered your brother, this is where you can survive. And are those people in those groups? And so it's the, I, that idea of a kind of loose people from all different uh, trying to survive from different places. But the group of the Akia that uh, uh, Kester Koenig and the others worked on, and they, they asked about, yeah, who's married to whom? And there's very little uh, marriage outside of the Akia. On the other way, the, the link, the fact that Okiek and Akiek are the same language with the same name, to me is an indication that they probably moved together with the Maasai who moved to the Maasai Plains all the way from Kenya, from the Mao forest where the Okya live. So that to me is an indication that uh, these people have been linked to the, to the Maasai for quite some, quite, quite some time and that they moved together. Anyway, so uh, Yes, um, a few remarks here. What I, I wonder what kind of tasks do these people do for their masters? I have seen rituals, burials, but sometimes also herding activities, herding goats and sh sheep are mentioned. Is there anything in common in what kind of task the robot people do to their masters, so-called masters? Um, they exchange honey, sure. Um, all these groups, they're, 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 they're famous for the honey collection and honey is very important to the, to the Oromo and to the Maasai for ritual and for medicine and for, uh, of course, for drink. And they get all sorts of other products for that. There's the, the issue of the survival in times of hunger, the beautiful story that Winter uh, brought to us to how the Asa lost their language because of the time of the Rinder pest and the Maasai lost their cattle and, and, and survived among the As, Asa villages, but then in, yeah, imposing their dominant language, Maasai, in the house itself. And that's what killed the language. Um, uh, some, somewhere in the literature, I found that, uh, that the, the food of the Dorobo is mainly meat and honey and that they don't, they're hunters more than gatherers. Which brings me to questions to you because I've been talking too much. What are the relevant dimensions here in, um, in distinguishing here? Is it population size? If, we con if people consider themselves in the same society, uh, on what grounds do they do that? What kind of methods of hunting, of gathering out of culture around honey collection do we actually have? Does that make a difference for uh, language use, for uh, language contact use, um, the intensity and, and, the, and, and, the, and the topics of language contact, uh, does that, how does that vary? Is that a dimension to take into account? The view on the self. Um, so uh, a lot of these people, they, um, they're in need of emancipation in that they, they have a low self-esteem and a high self-esteem for is that a high esteem for one particular group that they want to uh, achieve. Uh, a last question that I have is that I, I saw there's a, 
the Tenra mentions the calendar of, of uh, periods of hunger um, that they uh, that they find useful to to study history. I wonder is there any calendar of the epidemics of cattle disease that that we can use in in studying the history of these groups. Okay. Uh, yes, Hope. Hello. Uh, I, I have a very boring response, which is just a, I want a clarification on the master, what you mean by that. I think I, I may have some vague memory of what that means for uh, pygmy, pygmy social organization, but I don't understand how you're using it for East, in East Africa or what you're, where you might have identified it. What does that, what does it mean? Uh, uh, that 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 is my question too. Hope so. Thank you for it. Yeah, I um, this this ref, uh, it's mentioned in literature. So these these group of Vata are linked to that group of Oromo. Uh, they say uh, the Asa um, their masters are the Maasai, and uh, to me it feels not as concrete as these relations that I that I that I that I saw in practice among the pygmy, and that is a lot discussed a lot in the, in the literature among all the different pygmy groups. So, um, and and I, I I but I don't I didn't I didn't really research it. So I didn't ask myself those questions when I was among those people. I was just trying to get as many words I got, as I could and not much more. Um, you know, in in other groups like. Iraku, Iraku family will have a friend far away who is not Iraku, and that friend is the same friend in the next generation, in the next generation, and that is not master uh, servant because there's no difference in 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 hierarchy or respect, but they're long long term kind of. Uh, uh, friendships that are very, very beneficial because in times of, uh, of, of, of hunger, you, you know who you can depend on. And that's where they have to be far away. So this kind of yeah, links of family to family are to me not even restricted to the pygmies in, in West Africa. Um, but it, I, I, I had never heard or seen mentioned in the literature this kind of yeah, uh, personalized uh, master-servant uh, relationship when we talk about uh, the robo. And everywhere in the literature, they talk about uh, the, the robo as, as being servant uh, to their masters. Andrew, what are you saying there? Yeah, I wrote it in the chat, but I, I noticed that Sarah mentioned once that, that these kind of long term friendships uh, work in, in parts of Ethiopia where she uh, does her research. So that might be something worthwhile speaking uh, about with Sarah, I think. Yeah, 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 I have. I know. Uh, I think it's very general. Uh, I don't know. I don't see it anthropologist working on that, but I'm not reading everything on anthropology, but I. I Joking relations are discussed, but these kind of relations I don't see discussed so often, but I think it's, I have the feeling it's, it's quite general, but do they exist? Do the Hatsa have them? That's what I wonder. Do the, those Wata groups have them? Uh, I, I wonder. Right. Um, I see that your second and third questions here uh, are, is ethno-linguistic identity less vital for some of the hunter-gatherer groups? And is there less memory of history of the group among hunter-gatherer groups? And um, I have some thoughts on, on this. I, I wanted to go back to the uh, observation that you had noted about the Yaku uh, that um, Matthias Brenziger had written about but was reported also in, uh, in uh, Heinz 1974 work. Now he noted that the Yaku um, had this meeting in the 1930s. They sat okay, down and they okay. decided to give up. This was, this was the, the salient yeah. example. And I've always wondered what else occurred or what the larger sort of social political context was in that meeting. Who was there? 
what was said, but what was sort of the larger backdrop? Because I think that if we're talking about one commonality or one, one sort of connection that draws all of these people together is uh, sort of a, an extremely high level of oppression. Hunter-gatherer peoples all across East Africa, I think, are uh, almost, you know, are, are sort of in a unique state of, of oppression in that, um, you know, in, in most countries, hunting and gathering has been, has been illegalized. Uh, now, this is only yesterday, right, that, that hunting and gathering has been illegalized. Now, a notable exception is that um, Julius Nyerere gave the Hadzabe people a, uh, a hunting license in perpetuity at independence. Um, but of course, that would be too late in the historical record for these early explorers to have used that to differentiate the Hadza from other groups. But maybe it does say something that, that, that the Hadzabe could, um, could secure such a right uh, and other groups uh, that um, claim a hunter-gatherer identity or subsistence pattern could not um, obtain those sort of rights. Um, so, and I, and I think that this, and I think that this has linguistic um, uh, ramifications, the, these sort of high levels of, of oppression that these peoples face. Um, the fact that, you know, so, so going back to your questions, is ethno-linguistic identity less vital for these groups? Uh, I, I think that it probably isn't, but I think that the historical uh, and social challenges that have that these people have faced over you know the past one hundred plus years is actually have actually just been so um, I would say historically and sort of generationally traumatizing that people often feel that they need to hide or 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 change their identities as a matter of survival. So you wonder when this group of Yaku people sat down in the 1930s um, and said, you know, we have to stop speaking this language. Was it more a case of we are happy to uh, assimilate with, with this, these larger groups or is it this is, uh, this is a way that we, that we have, that, you know, this is an option that's available to us that will ensure the survival of our friends and family. And I think that that's something that needs to be thought about um, and, and that sort of bleeds into your question three, is there less memory of history among groups of, of hunter-gatherers? Um, it's interesting because when I, when I think of the Ihanzu and the uh, Gorwa, some of whom, you know, uh, like to talk about hunting-gathering, but who primarily identify as, you know, uh, agriculturalists or pastoralists, their grand histories often have to do with the occupation of the, of the land moving from somewhere else. Um, be that through being cast out from an original place and, and, and the way in which they, they, made the, they made sort of wildernesses or they made previously occupied places their own. Whereas when uh, I look at the recordings that Richard and I have for the um, Hadzabe uh, throughout the course of the ELDP project, their histories um, have less to do with the idea of moving uh, from another place, uh, though those stories do exist, but they, they, they have to do with other things. So I wonder, I wonder is, you know, when we think about history and when we think about sense of history, are we simply not looking at the right things or are we not being inclusive enough? Maybe when we, when we want to think about history, you know, maybe we need to look a little bit closer at some of these other things that the Hadzabi people are telling us in their stories. And maybe these are just as you know, maybe these are just as historical as, as stories from other peoples. Um, and again, also it might come down, it might come down to years and years of oppression. Maybe the idea of, of you know, maybe, maybe the, these people's histories have been, you know, have been considerably or have been consistently discredited, you know, uh, when you're living uh, next to or with a more powerful group uh, maybe it becomes easier or maybe, you know, you run into a lot of opposition. You try and say, well, we have a history in this area and maybe it would be, it probably be more convenient for a larger and more powerful group of people to say, well, no, we claim the history of this land and you are simply our, our hangers on. So after generations of this, you know, does, does this affect 
the, the way that history is conceived and thought of. Anyways, that's all just some food for thought, but I think that I think that it's really important to consider the angle of 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 oppression. I think that that sort of um, applies to these groups of people. When I thought you were going to say what brings them, what what they all have in common is high degree of individualism. <laughs> so, uh, um, not to say that I disagree, but. Uh, um, I think the, that's the other, that's the slant that I would take that um, maybe hunting uh, is, I mean, depending on how you hunt is, uh, um, but much more in uh, maybe an individual, I don't know, but, but I have the feeling that, uh, uh, that there's less of um, a group feeling, uh, less of a feeling that that people speaking the language means that there are a social group and ethnicity. Maybe not for the Hatsa, I don't know. But um, and with the memory, I what I what I had in mind is a, a few things. There is that the the Akiak have no memory of Okiak, and uh, and they're completely surprised that uh, that they hear from us that their the, the brothers there. Who speak the same language. It can't be that long ago. Um, but no recollection. And they are not interested actually. Um, the the uh, uh, when Tenra writes a little bit about uh, what he calls the, the, the more northern Sandawe and the southern Sandawe. And then the northern ones are those with a background in Alagua and Minaturu. And and they uh, they have uh, they know their family history generations back, but not the Bush Sandawe who can, yeah, maybe go at most three generations back to remember their family, uh, and this is within the same group and um, uh, a surprising lack of uh, of of memory to me. That that is why I brought this up. So, um, but you, you get these, these, these myths, eh? and, and when you're talking about oppression, that is very clear among all these myths among the Wata and the, and the, and the Oromo and, the, and other uh, oppressive groups in southern Ethiopia is that, that it is um, down to God to decide that you are nothing and you, you are wealthy. No? So, uh, it, uh, and those are endorsed. I mean, yeah, Wata believe in those myths as well, and they and they have a low self esteem. Um, is it only because they're oppressed? Because some of the observers are surprised because they they think, well, they have all the power in their hands, don't they? They 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 have the honey, and the honey is as, is essential for the for all the, all the rituals of the, of the Oromo and of the Maasai, the, 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 they can't survive. I mean, uh, when they have to bury somebody, they have to ask them Wata to do that. So, I mean, uh, from an outsider point of view, you, you, you're not so, it's not so clear who's the master and who's the servant here. Yet from inside, they see it that, that, that way. There's maybe a little bit of fear and respect for the for the servants because they have these powers, but the, but that is that that relationship uh, hope that is, uh, yeah I think in in need of emancipation and emancipation is possible. I mean the Yaku, I had to go there because to them it was. All of a sudden, after that meeting in the 1930s, important that they still had their language because they wanted a claim on their land, on that forest, and uh, communal land ownership was made possible by the Kenyan uh, uh, law. And, and, and they thought about land because the Maasai at the end of the 100 year lease to the colonialists, so land was an issue. In the area, and 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 they have found out that 
well, may, they may have been looking up to the Maasai for, for ages, but everybody else in Kenya looks down on the Maasai. So, I mean, what are you striving for? So there is this, they have the power apparently now themselves to, uh, to think of themselves differently and, and, and emancipation. So, yeah. What kind of oppression is there really from the, from the outsider? I mean, because when you talk about the state, it's the state oppression, eh? but that's not the oppression of the, the masters. The Hatsa don't have masters, but it's the oppression of the Maasai towards the, towards the Asa. I don't know. So I think it's, uh, it's not enough uh, to, uh, to, to portray them as, as people who have suffered uh, so much under, under the oppression for so long. Um, that they, I think they, are, they, they, have, they have means of, uh, and, and they're very inventive in, I mean, uh, the, the Asa now, they earn their money still by hunting, not by shooting, but by holding the gun of the of the professional hunters because they will miss anyway. So they'll shoot the, the animals for them and earn a lot of money that way. So, and they, they still find ways to, and they, they are not actually, I don't have the feeling that they're really poorer than the Maasai people around them. They, they're the ones who get the minerals out of uh, out of the illegal uh, mines there. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that you make some good points, Martin. I mean, yeah, and, and I think it's important to try and avoid sort of a one-dimensional yeah. deficit characterization by, by saying, yeah, I think that we do fall into, I think we do fall into traps by saying, okay, well, you know, or we could very easily follow the traps by saying, okay, well, this group of people is oppressed, therefore we need to start looking and characterizing them in terms of deficits. And I think it makes sense, you know, some of these characterizations that you've made will actually in certain ways they wield power, be that ritual or spiritual. And I think that these are important and useful things to continue looking at. Um, in terms of a linguistic and historical sort of point of view, I wonder what other sort of dimensions um, you know, I, I wonder what other sort of dimensions along which we can understand these people as similar or as different. I thought, and I have been reading uh, a lot, and recently in this whole Easter weekend was beautiful weather, but I was here on my, <laughs> on my computer reading on the robo and all those something else. And I, what I don't find in the literature is, or very little, is what, what, what kind of tasks uh, do these people do in terms of practical tasks, in terms of herding for the for the Maasai? Uh, sometimes I see they herd uh, goats and sheep for them, and uh, um, but I find very little in 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 a lot for the Wata and the in the ritual kind of things that they do for the Romo, but for the rest I don't find much. So I would be I would be interested in, in knowing more in, in, in what kind of uh, more regular contact is there between, between uh, the, the, the robo, let me call the, I'll call them the robo now, the, the robo and their masters. I mean, how, how they, some of them, they, they don't, I mean, the Akia, for example, they, they, they live in an Akia community, not far from the last side, but it's an Akia community. Uh, the Yaku live in their own uh, village, uh, the uh, Doldol, that's, that's a, a, a Yaku village, and that's separate from, from, from the Maasai. Yes, Hope? Yeah, I'm, I guess, I think I'm missing a, a little, like a logical connection of, I see that you're very interested in understanding the relationships between people and characterizing them, maybe coming up with some yeah, some, some clues about how these relationships might obviously have a relationship with the languages that they're speaking. I mean, that's the subject, but I'm, I'm not sure how uh, you're thinking what, what you will find will connect to their language histories exactly. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense why it doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah um yeah what, what goes, would, no. like what would be the ideal like you you find the thing that is what you're looking for what would that thing be i guess is a way of asking yeah yeah um there is um a nurse has this article about the dahalo history and uh because there's a click in dahalo i mean oversimplify things completely but because there's a click in Dahlo, uh, they they are one of those the robo people who um, who spoke a click language and then shifted to a Cushitic language that was the language of their master. And now, who were those mm. masters? They're not there anymore, but mm. that has survived in in, in that shift. Uh, and um, so the the Yaku speak a Cushitic language that is now shifted to an Anotic language. But then with that model in mind, before that, they, they must have spoken a click or any other language and hunter-gatherer language. <laughs> but that doesn't exist, but uh, hunter-gatherer. And then they, they shifted to a Cushitic language and now they're shifting to an Anotic language and they shift all the time. So is that model that, that some people, uh, have in, in their mind, and uh, and that is what what uh, was happening time and time again, uh, and I see it happening now. But I don't really understand how it happens, and if it happens, whether we can still see that it happened. So for the pygmy languages, yeah. um, there's this claim, and I I don't know whether I I I really am convinced already uh, that there must have been a form of pygmy language and we will have a talk here in on friday by kilian hatz who has claimed that uh, west and east pygmy languages that the things in common that are not common with any of the other language families so that there is a kind of substrate that points out to the to a form of common pygmy language but uh, uh, I, I, I want to know at some point whether I'm going to uh, look for that in East Africa or whether I'll convince myself that it is uh, this, this, this is a use, useless path to, to look for in East Africa. So when, they, when we have these shifts to the, uh, to the master language, I want to understand them. I want to understand uh, what uh, how, how that happens. I find the story of, of Christoph Winter for Dasa very uh, in, in instructive, eh, where he says, okay, they're bilingual, that goes on in a bil bilingual situation. And then there is this, uh, at, at least in conceptually completely hierarchy situation that, that we are low and your Maasai are high. So when those Maasai are in the house because they survive and they can go there, then they impose Maasai and, and then Asai is only used for hunting. But do they use something special for hunting? Do they use special, do they have special uh, codes when they go hunting? I, I don't know. I know only of these strange reporting hits that uh, Asa have. So uh, when they hit an animal and then they have a sort of, it's not a normal word, it's not even normal asa words, it's some, some weird cry, uh, but it's specific to what kind of animal they, they have hit. And I, Roger has an article that, that the Hatsa also have something like that. So, I think he refers to them as triumphal names. So if you, if you strike an animal with, it, with an arrow, you, you depending on, on what kind of animal, its gender, there's a special word that you would say. And it's right. gender. Kirk, no? Kirk Miller says that it's an, an imperative ending. I had, I had thought they were vocatives, but I agree that it's an imperative. Well, it, that fits, of course, the, yeah, <laughs> they're shouting it at someone. And, but is it in Hatsa? Are they also weird words that have no connection with the normal? Uh, the, yeah, the roots are usually quite different. So, like, uh, if it's an a, an eland or a, a lion, it's hubu in in the masculine singular, which is 
it isn't the word for lion or eland. Apart from that, is there anything about language use when 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 they're hunting? Well, uh, there's some st stuff in uh, uh, I think my paper on hunting terms in Clan, and also in the, um, the uh, Tom, my paper with Tom Goldman on the origin of uh, language and clicks and that, whereas uh, it had been suggested by Alec Knight that clicks wouldn't be recognized by animals as human language and therefore they were mm. especially good for hunting. And we said, this is totally nonsense. <laughs> In fact, you know, we very many animal communication terms are clicks. Like, clicks. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they, you know, they know this, and, and in fact, so we did a little survey of what was known of uh, Khoisan people's uh, hunting practices, and there's a lot of little signs, their sign language, sign terms, there's several articles on hunting signs in different languages. I did review an article on Hadza hunting signs. I reviewed it favorably, but it's never been published, so I don't know what's happened with that. But the, people also just whisper. You know, so they, they definitely avoid making loud clicks while hunting. So a, as an idea of clicks being useful for hunters, <laughs> it's nonsense. <laughs> um, I do know that the Hadza will whistle because you're in a, you're in the bush and you can't see one another with the bushes in the way. So these whistles let other people know where you are. Um, I'm you know, I'm a vegetarian. I'm not a hunter. I never did any hunting when I was hanging out with the Hadza, so <laughs> I don't have that much experience. No, Ani, something else that you mentioned in terms of language and 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 how Hadza children grow up a few a few sessions ago was really interesting, and you had talked about these studies that come out about Hadza childhood and the fact that. Hadza children in, 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 in many ways are considered just little adults. So rather than hanging around at the ankles of their parents, they often spend time with other Hadza children, or you know, one would assume if there were other children speaking other languages, they would hang out with other children who are speaking other languages. And how would that affect the acquisition of Hadza, for example, and Bonnie can fill in the gaps where maybe I was a little bit um, unclear. Well, there. And, and Kirk talks about how the Hadza just love getting new words, especially for animals, and that he uh, was there when some Italian tourists came through and they started using the Italian word for giraffe, you know, like it, how fun, like we have a new fun word for this. So there's kind of a freedom with language too. And, uh, you know, we don't know that much about linguistic ideologies of hunter gatherers. Um, but I think creativity and freedom and yeah, just uh, exploring the world around you through language is probably part of that. And, um, you know, and, and not just children, Andrew, but we, we must mention that Hadza women don't speak in the same way as women from pastoralists and farming groups. They tend to be pretty loud and talkative and uh, speak right up, which, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, I, I wonder. Yeah, I think we uh, we 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 better close. Uh, but but uh, I I wonder about this these language ecologies that uh, what 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 kind of repercussions has uh, has it if it's true that linguistic norms are are less rigid in these groups than than in some other groups. So uh, uh, has that repercussions in, in how we how we do our, our grammar writing, but also in, in how we see historical change going on. Is that maybe much not even uh, recognizable as change and much more? Yeah, and there are huge differences in, in the, the Asa as it is written uh, uh, in the beginning of the 19th century and, and after that. Of course, this is a dying language, but is that only because of the language shift or is that more general uh, that, that people are very tolerant in, uh, in having different, different words, new words, and um, that is something that is also on my mind. Do you think that we are in the last question, do you think that we are in a different world when we are studying language among these groups? 
in, in terms of in terms of your question, Martin, is this a different world uh, when we're looking at when we're looking at the language of of these groups, these hunter gatherer, these Dorobo groups? Um, I would be inclined to say no, in that the tools that we probably use, the analytic tools, are probably still usable, but I think if we look at things as a matter of difference in degree rather than kind, mm -hmm. I think that for various reasons, and we talked about them today, I mentioned, you know, I mentioned sort of social factors. You also mentioned, um, you know, patterns of, of movement and distribution across the land. We talked a little bit about language acquisition patterns, et cetera, um, that in turn are reflections of social organization. It really, um, pushes our methodological apparatus, I think, into a very different place. So maybe not an entirely new world, but maybe because these groups of people weren't the targeted groups of people when these tools were being developed for various reasons, I think that they challenge uh, the way that we, they challenge our methodologies. And I think that that's exciting. And I think it's something to keep in mind when we work with these groups. Yeah, and Didier, you 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 work with pygmies a lot, and 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 also with uh, Mangbetu. And do you have the feeling that that language plays a different role in terms of identity in, among those when you compare those groups? Well, I don't know how to respond to that, Martin. Mm -hmm. But certainly, when well, well, in the theory. Um, I, I don't know exactly how the, the question of identity is taken by the pygmies themselves. Yeah. Um, certainly, it, it, well, it, it depends at, uh, how, how you, you, you make the question to them, because, I mean, if you, for example, if you are in a pygmy camp and you spend, well, let's say a few months in a pygmy camp where they are basically pygmies, uh they have a kind of identity that they, i mean there's a kind of there are two worlds there's a world in the forest and the world outside of the forest but for example with the fa with whom i have spent quite a long of quite a lot of time if you are in the forest of here outside of the forest they will tell you outside the forest or let's say at the edge of the forest if you if they are among the, the lesse or the mamvu, they will tell you that they are lesse and mamvu without any problem. If they are inside the forest, they will tell you that they are efe. And so you start to scratch to, to, to stretch your hair. So, so what, what are you telling me? Mm. And they say you will, they will tell you it's the same thing. Uh, and so that's where the problem starts. Because to, to them, I mean, there is. I mean, it, it, it all depends of the of the the, the, the social environment, on mm -hmm. the way they define the the, 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 the identity, and uh, I must say that I have thought of that well after I came back from my last trip with the pygmies. Mm -hmm. I mean, when when they were telling me that they were Mamvu, I was thinking as a linguist. Well, mm -hmm. okay, they are Mamvu Efe. Mm -hmm. And well, the same kind of people where you're on the side of the forest, they will tell you that they are effy. And but the same band might shift to a lesser area and they will tell you later that they are lesser. So, I mean, and, and the problem with the pygmies is a bit different as far as I understand the problem of East Africa. If you take the effy, they cover a huge territory and effy are in contact with Bantu and Central Sudanic speaking people of various groups. And so the, the kind of, let's say, dialectology that you have among the FA has simply not been studied. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Shevesta and Ahmad Bursens did in, the, in 1952-53, if I remember well the dates, they made a one-year trip all around the Ituri to study that problem. Um, I have the notes of, of both of them. I have a copy of them that uh, Nico Bursens gave me, well, some 30 years ago or something like that. And the problem is that, unfortunately, uh, Ahmad Bursens did a pretty terrible work. And I think that uh, eventually 
Shevesta and Burson's never published that, that, that work. I think Shevesta was thinking of making the fifth volume of, you know, that he made at the Belgium Academy of Overseas Sciences four volumes on the Ituri Pygmies, and he was thinking of making a fifth volume on the language. It never came out. And I think these notes are useful for a linguist who wants to look at details of the languages, but I think it's really hard to make any kind of synthesis with that. First, Shebesta started with the Latin grammar model, then shifted to the, eventually shifted to Bantu. But I think he was doing a much better work than, than Bursons did, and Bursons was the linguist at that time. Nico mm. is not here to hear me, so mm. I can say that. Uh, but I think this is, this is really unfortunate. The only thing that there is interesting in that is that there are tapes that they, that they, that they took at that time, and someone should analyze that one day, and uh, probably we should find some automatic way of uh, of looking at these things. Because I mean, it's not a huge material, but if you really want to look at details and to make a kind of di useful dialectology, you have to hear the tapes, and there is no other way to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think this is I think this is a very different kind of problems compared to. Uh, to what you have in East Africa, but if I can, I, I speak too much now. Mm. Um, but going back to the East Africa problem and the click, let's say looking at the at the clicks, we've been talking that with Andrew and you uh, in the field uh, or, or or back from from Tanzania. I think if you look at the story of the clicks, it's it's too bad that Bonnie is not here anymore. I think Bonnie and Tom Gilderman made a paper one day uh, criticizing um, a paper that saying that cliques were a remnant of ancient humanity. Hmm. I think there is a different way of looking at that. Clique is a reuse, or is probably a reuse of swallowing, of swallowing mechanism. And so all the question of, of cliques in languages if it's a reuse of some basic physiological mechanism, first of all, as Bonnie and Tom said at that time, they didn't have this evidence, but I think or this kind of, let's not evidence, but this kind of, of hypothesis is that it could have been invented at various time in history, and it could be a more recent uh, uh, thing that appeared in the languages, because we see clicks as something that it's old and that should, uh, as a consequence, be vanishing gradually, but it could be completely different in the history of languages. It mm. could have been, in a way, you know, appeared at one point in history. We have no trace of that. But if you look at Velarik, uh, at the uh, initiation mechanism, you look at the, all the languages that have labiovelars, labiovelars, it's a velaric airstream mechanism, but it's similar to clicks. So in that case, clicks are not special. I mean, uh, they are part of a more general pattern of initiation mechanism that's shared by hundreds of African languages, not a few Khoisan languages. And so the way we look at these things, looking at the sound systems, uh, we look at basic mechanism of speech production and the way sound systems are shaped. And I know that things can change in history, but if you look at some of these specificities, looking at the Ituri languages, all the Ituri languages have a complex set of labiovelars. Um, it is not the case of, of most of the languages that surrounds them, but you find labiovelars up to West Africa. But again, this kind of mechanism could simply have, you know, developed a complex, be part of the complexification of sound systems. Mm -hmm. Because seeing sound systems as a thing that, as something that has to simplify, I don't think that's a good way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also at variation, we've been talking about that with the Hatsa and the Iraq, you and, and with you and Andrew. If you look, you can predict the kind of variation if you have a click loss. So Tony Trailer had shown them very nicely for South African languages. But now if you look at the, the, the most probable uh, ejective that can be linked to a click between Hadza and, and, and Iraku, if we have, we should look at data now, but I can almost, if you look at the lateral click, 
it will become uh, if it changes it can change as a villa affricated ejective mm -hmm. we have we we have some words of that that we've been recording with andrew uh, and so these things are, are there is some relation between the two things now we have to, we need to have some good lexicon to be compared for for these things or, or maybe it's a different way of looking at the comparative work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, I am a phonetician, so I'm a very simple, simple linguist. Sorry, but I could simple questions. No, but I think this is this is a way of looking at of looking at the things. But looking at this click story, it, we're talking about Dahalo. That's what made me think of that. Mm. Why yeah. should I mean, if they were speaking, be part of a larger click set at one point? What uh, what happened to those clicks? They didn't vanish on a finger clip. I mean, there, there must be some predictable, words, some predictable way, predictable way uh, to to see what they became. And looking at the languages, that would be very interesting to look at. Yeah, but we need data. As always, it's it's a question of data. Oh, sorry, but uh, no, no, I, I I find the whole explanation also about. Um, but uh, if you're in the forest and the other world, uh, intriguing. And I see, yeah, connection with the Bacola situation and, and only partly with East Africa because there's, there's not, what I find so interesting is, is, is the chameleonic, uh, the, lang the language and the identity is in essence to be a chameleon and, and you don't, I don't have that feeling in, in East Africa, but I still have the feeling that um, that yeah, that there is no, there's nothing uh, so clear and simple like an ethnic identity that is linked to language. That 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 is actually quite common all over the, the place, but I don't see that for. For Akia, also, if you look at the way they call the other people, that that that's not the the, the dimension how they how they uh, view the world. And mm -hmm. also, if they can decide, uh, Yaku, okay, uh, we be we speak Maasai, then maybe it's not because they want to be other. They want they don't yeah. It, that doesn't that doesn't change them. It's they, they will, this is just a language. As if, well, uh, nah, go on. This is my ethnological obsession. But if you look, if you compare the pygmies and any kind of, let's say, farmers that you have in the Ituri area, there is, these are two different worlds. I mean, and do we find this in East Africa between the hunter gatherers and the other? I don't know. I have no answer to that. Mm -hmm. And that's why, personally, I would like so much to go among the Sandawi because I probably they they all they might hold a key to to respond to that. They are farmers. Yes. Okay. But they 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 could they they could retain some. If you look at, for example, at the music of the Gogo people, I mean, it has nothing to do with hunter gatherers, but music of the Gogo people is built on patterns similar, very much similar to what you find among the, the let's say, the Northeast Bantu, the Northeast uh, Pygmies of Congo. And the same kind of musical polyphonies, you find them among the Dizi in, in, uh, in Ethiopia. I mean, there are various spots where you have these kind of things. Uh, where does it come from? I mean, it could be simply chance that it appeared several times in the history. But these musical uh, these musical systems are extremely sophisticated systems. If you analyze them formally, I mean this is, I mean this kind of polyphony is no joke at all. Uh, if you look at them from a formal point of view, this is polyphonic music built on counterpoint, canon, and, and you know all these kind of very sophisticated uh, or what we find in Western music something sophisticated. Mm -hmm. But you don't find them, you don't find that uh, in, in many populations. And so in Tanzania, the Gogo are, are, are having a very special system for that. 
do we find that with hunter-gatherers? What kind of music do they have? I mean, what I've heard for, for Hatza up to now, there was a pretty terrible CD that has been published by someone that doesn't, I think, give a lot of credit to the Hatza, unfortunately, because I don't think that the Hatza are responsible for that pretty terrible stuff. I'm sure that they have much better than that. And it's, it's always, you have to, I mean, if you look at music, you have to take that seriously, uh, but that takes time and we don't have time. Or you have to be lost some for some time uh, in, in a place. Maybe that's the conclusion, we don't have time. <laughs> time is up. I yeah, I, I think for today, maybe you should uh, call it an end. So thank you very much, Marta, for discussion and everyone else for participating. I'd like to just say, uh, looking ahead, that the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 4th of May. It's going to be presented by Alexander Anderson and Andrew Harvey, and it's titled The Form of Emotions, the Phonetics and Morphology of Interjections in Hatsa. So with that, uh, thank you again, Marta, and I look forward to seeing everyone else at the next webinar.